I don't believe in over drying. I don't believe in the fact that it exists. I don't believe in the fact that it's possible to do it. And I think that when we say we over dried a resin, we've actually done something else. And it's really important to make the distinction between the terms we use. I was just down at one of the dryer manufacturers this morning talking with them and one of the first words out of their mouth was, yep, we worked on a problem with a brittle nylon part and it was brittle because it was over dried. And I said, no, it wasn't. It was brittle because the material was oxidized while it was being dried. The moisture content was immaterial to the condition. Well, any nylon, 6, 6, 6, doesn't make any difference. Um, there's a reason nylon suppliers tell you to dry the material at a certain temperature. And it's because when you turn the temperature up much above that point, you actually start to damage the material. Yes, it will get drier at 250F than it does at 180F, but that's not the reason it's brittle. Now, there's a lot that goes on when we take water out of a material, and we want to talk about that, but the greater risk by far is not taking enough moisture out of the material. And it's unfortunate that we're getting on this train because it started with nylon, and now everybody's jumping on the bandwagon. We've got people putting maximum drying times on their data sheets. Don't dry this stuff for more than 12 hours. And my question is, or what? What's supposed to happen at the 13th hour? You know, everything turns to powder or something? Um, you know, we know what relative thermal index is, right? UL says you can expose this material for seven years to this temperature without anything terrible happening. Relative thermal indexes are usually higher than the recommended drying temperatures. So here's UL saying you can expose this material to this temperature for seven years, and the resin manufacturer saying you can't expose it to this temperature for more than 12 hours. There's something wrong here. Things don't make any sense until we look at the data and we see what's going on. So, you know, this is a good example of we tend to believe what we've been told. Such as, stock market always goes up. Or Saturday Night Live is funny. Or Nancy Grace is a journalist. Or the seats on the airplanes are getting smaller. And this one, it's possible to overdry your nylon, your molding compound. It is possible to damage your molding compound while drying it. But if it's brittle, it has nothing to do with your moisture content. So when we get all done with this, this will be a very freeing operation. The truth will set you free. But first, it will piss you off. Well, it's fine. All right, so let's define our terms. Drying can cause various changes to a polymer while in the process of removing the moisture. Among them are color shift. We all know this. Color shifts are usually the early signs of oxidation. Not always, but usually. Removal of volatile constituents. If I have a lubricant in there or a plasticizer in there and I turn the temperature up too high, I can pull that out. That will influence the way the material flows once it's in the barrel. And it could influence the properties of the material as well. You can also, and this is the greatest concern, you can also oxidize the resin. This usually happens with nylons because nylons are the most sensitive materials to this behavior. And unlike materials like ABS and polycarbonate, where if we turn the temperature up too high, we get the immediate feedback of a pellet the size of the hopper. Nylon doesn't melt until we get up to 450, 500 degrees Fahrenheit. So we can put the coals to this stuff and not see any evidence, especially if we're running black material, not see any evidence we've got a problem. But we are changing the properties of the material, and we can measure this. So what are we really doing when we remove moisture? The melt viscosity of materials like nylon, PET, PBT, these are all what we call condensation polymers. One thing we know that happens when we dry the material down is the melt viscosity goes up. And I'll show you some graphs of what this looks like. Because when you get to a certain point in the drying cycle, the melt viscosity starts to go up dramatically. And this is the first thing that molders complain about. Is, oh, I couldn't fill the part when I got it dry. Well, that's not the problem of the resin. That's the problem of your machine. Your machine's pressure limited. Your viscosity went up, and your machine couldn't adjust for that higher viscosity. Lower moisture contents in these resins equals higher viscosity. So one of the things you'll run into if you're running a, a highly reinforced nylon, for example, and you get it really, really dry, and you're going for a good resin-rich finish, you're going to struggle. 
because the higher viscosity makes it more difficult to bury that glass underneath the surface. And I've seen people struggle with this. I had a guy come into my office one day. He said, I got this glass filled nylon part. He said, I can't get a good finish. And I said, well, what's your moisture content? He says, 0.018. I said, well, that's kind of low. So let's do this. Let's take it out of the, the, the box, take it out of the hopper, put it back in the box, let it sit there for a couple hours. We'll measure the moisture content. It came up to 0.07, put it back in the machine, beautiful parts. Okay, so that's a moisture content issue. That's a legitimate moisture content issue. There's nothing wrong with the parts he made at 0.018 mechanically. They just don't look very nice. And he needed to bring the viscosity down so he could get a better looking part. That's a legitimate change in performance that comes with the higher viscosity. But mechanical properties improve as moisture content goes down, always. The guys who run preforms, PET preforms, they know this. They dry down to 50 ppm. Why do they do that? Because they're going for the absolute best performance they can get from the resin, because they know someone's going to take that preform and blow it into a thin wall bottle, fill it with a fluid, and someone's going to drop that bottle someday, and it's not supposed to break. They're trying to retain as much molecular weight as they possibly can. So they dry down to 50 parts per million, and they engineer their processes and their tooling and their machines to deal with the elevated viscosity that, that comes with it. They don't believe in over-drying. They know better. Drying to very low moisture levels does not, does not cause brittle behavior. That is a mistake that we've made because we confuse drying with another process that goes on when we dry materials inappropriately. Usually that means too high of a temperature, and that is that we oxidize the polymer. We can measure the effects of this oxidation simply by running melt flow tests. Watch the melt flow just take off on the material when you dry it at a high temperature. The fact that the melt flow is going up tells you the molecular weight is going down, and that's what causes your brittle parts, not the moisture content of the resin. This is an example of what I'm talking about. This is a study that was done, this is a slide from a study that was done by some gentlemen at Wilson Fiberfill, back when there was a Wilson Fiberfill, back in Evansville, Indiana, um, on a 30% glass reinforced PET. They did this in a capillary rheometer, constant shear rate, 400 reciprocal seconds. You can see the moisture contents from 0.2%, which for PET is really wet, to 0.02%, which is what the resin supplier tells you you're supposed to dry the material down to. Notice what happens as the material continues to get drier. As it goes from 0.02 to 0.01 and then to 0.005, the viscosity actually goes up by another 25%. So if you're running a process and you're running a machine that has less than 25% of the pressure needed to adjust for that, when you hit that higher viscosity, what's going to happen to your process? It's going to go out of control. You won't have the first stage pressure required to maintain the constant velocity. The machine will slow down. You'll start to have processing problems. And the conclusion people draw is, well, I'm having these problems because I overdried the material. We can look at this in a number of different resins, a number of different ways. Here's a plot for... PBT, same thing. Look at what happens when the moisture content drops down to about, well, 0 0.01, 0 0.012. The viscosity starts to shoot up. It goes down when the material gets wet. We know why that happens. It's breaking down. It's hydrolyzing. But it goes up in all of these resins. We, we can see this in any number of materials. Here's, here's what happens to the nylon's melt flow rate as you dry it. Here's a, a batch of nylon dried down to 0.035%. Test the melt flow rate, you get a value of 10.5. Take the same resin, let it come up to 2,000 parts per million, and the melt flow rate goes up to 15. Same small sample of resin exhibits different kinds of behavior as the moisture content changes. This is why nylon suppliers don't like to do melt flow rate. Drives them crazy, they can't get a consistent value because they don't bother to check the moisture content before they run the melt flow rate test. If they did, they'd actually have an easier time doing that. Here's another example. This is melt flow rate. Again, this is for a polycarbonate PET blend. And you can see, this is, a, this is Bayer's data, and this is our data in the lab. You can see they, they compare pretty well. But the main point is the, moisture, the melt flow rate goes up as your moisture content goes from 0.01 to 0.02 to 0.03 and so on. So we can show this over and over and over again, the effect of viscosity or the effect of moisture content has on viscosity. So these guys, coming back to this PET for a moment, these guys at Wilson Fiberfield did this study 
and they notice that the viscosity is going up as the moisture content is going down, and they say, well, let's make some tensile bars and some impact disks out of this stuff and see what happens to the properties as the moisture content goes down. Well, guess what? The properties follow the moisture content. The higher the viscosity, the lower the moisture content, the better the properties got. Significantly so. The, the impact strength of the low molecular weight PET went up by about 30% when it was molded at 0 0.005 as opposed to 0 0.02. So this whole notion that by pulling water out of the material we somehow make it brittle is just simply not something that's scientifically provable. This is the tensile strength value. Same thing, tensile strength goes up as well. Okay, here's a, some work we do with a client over a course of about six months. So the x-axis here is just the Julian date, whatever, you know, 150 days into the year is May, 300 days into the year is November or the end of October. This guy started out, he's running Glassville PET and he had brittle parts. And um, this is melt flow rate. He's starting out with a 10 melt flow rate resin. So we want to be below this line if we can be in the molded part. This is kind of a borderline area and then this, anything above it is, is trouble when it comes to molecular weight. So he's got brittle parts. We checked his resin. His resin moisture content was 270 ppm. That's 0.027%. That's wet for PET. Dried it down to 180, number gets better. Dry it down to 120, number continues to get better. This again shows you that the drier the material, the better the molecular weight retention. Now he ultimately fixed the whole problem by getting his melt temperature down as well and by getting into a smaller injection unit. But you can see the progression of retained molecular weight improving as the moisture content gets lower and lower. And this again shows us that lower moisture content is what we want. We don't want to be playing a game with borderline moisture contents. So what about nylon? Nylon is a special case everyone talks about. I mentioned today I've already had one conversation about a nylon part that was brittle. Everyone knows you can overdry nylon and make it brittle. That is completely false. That is absolute fiction. And we can prove it. And we have proved it. And I'll show you the data. Um, again, this is viscosity. Again, done in a capillary areometer as a function of moisture content. Look what happens to the viscosity of the nylon when you get to about 0.02%. This is a 33% glass filled resin. So 0.02% doesn't mean 0.02% in the polymer. A third of the compound is glass. Glass fiber doesn't absorb water. So understand that 0.02% in this material really means about 0.035 in the resin. The viscosity shoots up very dramatically. Same thing happens when you measure it at, at, at a, a low shear rate. There are a lot of people out there, this is what they encounter. When they get the material really dry, this viscosity just takes off and they start having all kinds of problems with the process and the conclusion is, well, it's because the material is over dried. And this somehow relates to brittleness. Now, I'll show you the results in a minute of an experiment we do. We took material, we dried it down very, very dry and we did so in a way that we knew was damaging the resin. We intentionally degraded it while we were drying it. Got it down to about 0.02. Then we put the water back in. Because if it really is just about over drying, if we put the water back in before we make parts, we should get good parts. We didn't get good parts. We still had brittle product. And this is the distinction. Water removal is a reversible process. I can take water out of nylon, I can put it back in the nylon. I can do that over and over and over again. Oxidation is a one-way street. Once you've oxidized the polymer, it's done. You cannot unring that bell. You have done damage to the material, and that's the reason that your material is, be, is misbehaving. So what are all the things that happen to the properties of nylon as the moisture content goes down? Well, here's one thing we know about nylon. Nylon soaks up a lot of water after the part's molded. It also soaks up a lot of water as raw material. And one of the things that happens to your molded part, once it picks up water, is that the modulus starts to come down. You know, what really happens is, this is modulus versus temperature, so what really happens is the glass transition's going down, but we're stuck here at room temperature. So what we see is, oh look, the material's getting more flexible as it gets wet. Anybody who's conditioned nylon before knows this. You take a dry as molded nylon part, comes out of the press, feels stiff, feels rigid, somewhat brittle. You put it in a, in a paper, a plastic bag inside a box, you throw a little water in, you tie a knot in it, 
You come back a couple of days later, you take the parts out, boy, they feel soft and flexible and rubbery. That's the plasticizing effect of the nylon. So we did a little study. And one of the things that we did is we took nylon six pellets at different moisture contents and we measured the moisture content of the pellets and then we molded specimens from those pellets and immediately upon getting the part out of the mold, we took the part into the lab, measured the moisture content of the part. We wanted to see where the water went. And it was interesting. This is the data. This is the raw material, molded part. Raw material, molded part. The numbers are very close together. In fact, they're a little higher in the molded part than they are in the raw material. For reasons I'll explain in a little bit. Once the moisture content gets up above 2,000 parts per million, the numbers stop deviating. They actually become pretty much the same. And then as the moisture content continues to go up above 2,000 parts per million, we start to find there's less water in the molded part than there is in the pellets. And the reason for that is because when you get the level of moisture up high enough to where you actually start to degrade the material, water is being consumed by the chemical reaction that's causing the degradation. That's hydrolysis, and that's why we want to dry our nylon. So here's what we're saying. If we put very dry pellets into the machine, we get very dry parts. If we put marginally dry pellets in the machine, we get marginally dry parts. The minute they pop out of the press, they have different moisture content. Since we know that very dry nylon parts are stiffer and more brittle than nylon parts with some water in them, it shouldn't be a big surprise to us that right out of the mold, very dry pellets make very dry parts, and those very dry parts are, to our way of thinking, somewhat brittle. Now, the thing is, the moment that part hits the, hits the air, what starts to happen? It starts to absorb water. So the properties we really care about are the properties at equilibrium, which can take a couple of days if we do it by conditioning. It could take weeks or months if we just let nature take its course. But the point is, to really determine if we've done any harm to the material, we need to evaluate the material after it's reached some kind of an equilibrium condition, not the minute it comes out of the press. So we did that work. Here's some material that was dried at two different times at two different temperatures. We dried at 80 C, which is the recommended drying temperature that all the nylon producers tell you to use. And then we did 120 C. What's 120 C? That's the temperature a lot of molders actually use. Why? Because this stuff's been sitting in a warehouse for six months in an open container. They pull it out of the warehouse. It's really wet and they get impatient. And they know if they crank the temperature up to 120, it'll dry but it will also become damaged at the same time. And those two processes occur together, so we need to understand which one is doing the damage. Now, we did this for 15 hours, and we also did it for 275 hours. 275 hours, just to make a point. That's about, um, what, 10 days? And then we did impact tests, falling dart impact tests. Now, this is dry as molded, so you can see very good toughness at 15 hours, not such good toughness at 275 hours. And you say, aha! See, you overdried the material. But then we condition these two sets of parts. They have the same performance. Nothing's been done to this material that can't be undone just by bringing the material to an equilibrium moisture content. Now, at 120C, different story. At 120C, 15 hours, look what happened. But here again, if we kept the, if we kept the time frame short, once they're conditioned, the material's actually in pretty good shape. This stuff never came back. This is degraded material. This is not overdrive material, it's degraded material. And it's really important to make that distinction. This is another example. This is the stuff we dried down to, to 0.02, and then we brought it back to 1800 by putting water back in, and then we molded parts. So stay with me here, this is a little bit of a logic thing. Very brittle material when we test dry as molded parts, dry, made with resin, dried down to 200 ppm. Once we condition that, the stuff dry for a shorter period of time comes right back up. The stuff dry for a longer period of time doesn't. At 1800 ppm, 
we get recovery of the stuff that was dry for a short time. We never get recovery of the stuff that was dry for a long time. This stuff has been damaged and it's never going to come back. Molecular weight of this material is low. And we know that because we've tracked this material by looking. This is what happens to melt flow rate. This is dried at 80 C. The melt flow rate of the material is virtually constant. The molecular weight of the material is very stable as a function of drying time, even though the drying time was very extended. When you dry the material to 120 C, the melt flow rate takes off on you. And by the time it gets up to even this point here, you already have some concerns about what's happening to the material at a molecular level. And it just keeps on going. This is the mechanism that, that people mistake for over drying. It's not about over drying, it's about degradation. Okay, now we repeated this with nylon 6.6. And one of the things we wanted to do with the 6.6, when you buy nylons, some nylons are what we call general purpose materials. And then we have these nylons we call heat stabilized materials. Now, why do we use heat stabilized nylon? You want to be able to stay in the heat for a long time. Right. Not because nylon does oxidize, when you get the temperature up above 80 C, that oxidation causes damage to the material. The heat stabilizer protects the nylon from the oxidation. In fact, if you go over and talk to the guys at DuPont in the South Building, they've got a new heat stabilizer now that it now raises the bar not just to 120 or 130 C, but all the way to 160, 170, 180. New chemistry to push the material. The nylon polymer is still vulnerable, but we're protecting it. So we got to thinking, if heat stabilized nylon is designed to work for long periods of time at 120 C, what happens if we dry it at 120 C? Shouldn't be a problem. Well, we tried that. First of all, here's the study we did on the 6.6. I mentioned this before. Here's your pellet moisture content. Here's your part moisture content. Notice that the, the pellets are a little drier than the part until you get to this point here, which is 2,000 parts per million, and then the part becomes drier than the pellets. What's going on here? Below 2,000 parts per million, nylon can undergo a, a continued process of polymerization if it's really, really dry. It's called solid state polymerization, except in this case it was done in the melt state. But anyone who makes nylon will tell you, if you take nylon, put a nitrogen blanket over it, heat it up to about 400 degrees Fahrenheit and leave it there for 16, 18, 20 hours, you'll end up with a higher molecular weight material than you started with. That's a fact. It's called solid state polymerization. It's done all the time. Why do they do it in nitrogen? Because it's the oxygen that's doing the damage to the polymer. If you did it in oxygen, you'd chew the material up. But you do it in nitrogen, you protect the material, and you get a higher molecular weight. When you produce higher molecular weight nylon, one of the things that happens is you give off water as a byproduct. So why is the part wetter than the pellets? Because we're actually creating a small amount of water while we're molding the parts. Just a small amount, but we're making a little bit of water while we're molding the parts because the molecular weight of the material is actually going up because it's going into the material process very, very dry. And we know this because when we look at the melt flow rate of molded parts, produced with different moisture content resins, and the moisture content goes up. Our, our pellet melt flow rate is 21 and a half. So when we reach this point, we've gone up 30%, which is the point where we start getting a little concerned about properties. When we get to 40%, we're really concerned about properties. And you can see that there's a relationship between increasing moisture content and decreasing molecular weight. This is the reason we dry nylon in the first place. Okay, so here's the nylon 6.6. Does the same thing as the 6 did. Notice the time scale of the experiment, though. 770 hours. I wanted to make a point. So we dried this stuff for 32 days. I figure if we're going to overdry something, we're going to really overdry it. But again, the melt flow rate at 80C barely changes. The melt flow rate at 120 goes through the roof. Now, this is general purpose nylon 6.6, no heat stabilizer. This is what happens to the molecular weight of the material before and after drying. This is the stuff out of the bag. This is the stuff after being in the dryer at 120 C for 340 hours. The first thing we did is run intrinsic viscosity and it, went, it only went down 10%. Now that's typically an okay number, but we had brittle parts. So we thought, well, there's gotta be something going on. So we did molecular weight distribution. Look what happens to the molecular weight distribution. It gets broader and it gets broader on the low molecular weight side than it does on the high molecular weight side. 
And this little peak down here, those are called oligomers. If you say any polymer chemistry, you know oligomers are those little pieces of polymer chain that never grew up to be fully fledged polymer. Why is that fraction going up? Because when you break polymer chains, you don't always just break them in the middle. They sometimes break near the ends. So we've created a significant amount of degradation. Mind you, this material was never put through the molding process. All we did was dry it, and we created this damage. Now, we did the same thing with heat-stabilized nylon. Look what happens to the melt flow rate. It goes down. And it goes down more for 120C than it does for 80C. In fact, we started out with a melt flow rate of 22, and within a very short period of time, we had dropped the melt flow rate of the material to six. Now, do you think that would cause a problem for most processors? Yeah. And what will they tell you? Oh, well, I haven't because I overdried the material. No, what you actually did is you actually increased the molecular weight of the material. We know that because we did the GPC on that as well. And here's your out of the bag material. And there's your dry material. As you go to the left, your molecular weight's going up. So molecular weight's increasing. Notice the oligomer region didn't budge. We didn't break any chains. We built chains. Now, you may say, well, so, now we, we were able to mold this material because we had a machine that was capable of dealing with the increase in melt flow rate or the decrease in melt flow rate. Um, and so here's general purpose nylon, dried aggressively, um, very brittle, as molded, also conditioned. The impact properties didn't get any better with conditioning. That's because the material's been destroyed. But now here's the heat stabilized stuff. Dry at 80C, dry at 120C. If you haven't done falling dart impact tests before, you may not know the significance of these numbers. But these are the parts that were impact tested, okay? When you test polycarbonate this way, you typically get 50 foot pounds for a value to break. These parts are every bit as tough as any polycarbonate you'd ever make. And all we did to get them that way was leave the material in the dryer for a really, really long time. We did not make the material brittle. Quite the contrary. We made it very, very tough. So this is the magic of the heat stabilizer. The heat stabilizer not only protects the resin from the elevated temperature, it actually allows the material to build molecular weight while it's being dried. And in fact, this is a DuPont resin. This is 101, uh, 103HS. And I went to one of the chemists at DuPont, and I said, tell me something. Does heat stabilization actually make polymerization happen? And he said, yeah. <laughs> and I said, can you tell me why? He said, no, I'm not going to tell you why. I'll pass these around so you can see it. These materials, both these samples, were made from resin that was dried for a month. The lighter colored part was dried at 80C. The darker colored part was dried at 120C. If anything could be said to be overdried, it would be these specimens. But they're not brittle. In fact, the normal drying process produces a part that looks like this. Dry as molded nylon is brittle. Normally, these were tested dry as molded. They're not brittle because the molecular weight went up. And molecular weight going up produces better properties. Now, these are just the pictures. We know this is about oxidation because if we repeat the experiment in vacuum, the melt flow rate stays stable. And this is another thing. If you go to material supplier recommendations for drying nylon, they'll tell you, 80C, but if you're going to do it in vacuum, you can turn the temperature up. You can do it at 110 or 115. Why? Because it's not about the heat. It's about the heat in combination with the oxygen. And that tells us that it's oxidation. So this is drying at 120 in vacuum, drying at 120 in air. If you don't have the air, you don't do the damage. So just a few things to kind of recap. Viscosity in nylon rises with declining moisture content. If you have a pressure limited process and you dry your material down to a very low level, you will experience processing problems. That is a fact. Those processing problems have nothing to do with anything you did to the resin. It is a natural consequence of removing lots of water from a condensation polymer. Molecular weight goes up, viscosity goes up, and you're going to have a tougher time pushing the material. However, 
if you make parts from that resin, if you can make parts from that resin, they will have better properties, better properties, not worse properties, than the stuff that you dried down to 1,000 ppm or whatever. Um, the moisture content in the nylon pellets is pretty much retained in the molded parts. Drying at elevated temperatures in air causes oxidation and chain scission in general purpose nylons. That's the reason the material gets brittle. Not because of its moisture content, because of how you treated it to get it to that moisture content. This is like the difference between baking a cake for an hour at 350 or baking a cake for a minute at 600 F. You may have put the same amount of heat in, but you didn't do it the same way, you didn't get the same results. These changes we're all talking about are the primary cause of the property losses that are bl usually blamed on over drying. And I will tell you, there's a lot of people in this industry who have a great deal of respect for who are still teaching, make sure you don't dry the nylon below a certain level or it's going to be bad. And it's, it's something we've just simply got to get away from, from saying because it's wrong. And there's no facts to support it. Moisture conditioning increases ductility in nylons. We know that through a mechanism that reduces the TG of the material. Beyond a certain point, the brittleness caused by chain scission and oxidation cannot be covered up by conditioning. I know people who do this. They run degraded nylon and then they soak it in water. You know, and for a while it's ductile. Trouble is, if you can't keep all that water in there, sooner or later it's going to come out and the parts going to show its true colors. So that's that's something you got to be careful about. But we need to make a distinction between general purpose nylons and heat stabilized nylons because the heat stabilizer changes the game. The heat stabilizer enables you to do things with a drying process that will not cause you the same kinds of problems that it will in general purpose, as long as you don't mind that color change. But then again, if I was molding black parts, you'd never know that anything happened there. The high viscosity of very dry nylon may present processing challenges in pressure limited processes. That's a fact. The increase in viscosity causes a dramatic increase in impact resistance. This has been proven over and over and over again. But I will bet you anything, go, to, go talk to any dryer manufacturer on this floor and bring up nylon, and they will, the first words out of their mouth will be overdry. Watch out that you don't overdry. In fact, it's really going to be interesting to see what happens now because. The folks down at Novatech have something which I think is a game changer. They have an ability now to measure moisture content in the hopper while you're running. Okay? And it's for real. It's based on a technique called dielectric properties. There is a direct relationship between dielectric properties and moisture content. This is technology that's been around for 35 years, but no one's been able to figure out how to commercialize it until now. And so now people are going to start buying dryers that actually have a number on the screen that says, this is your moisture content. But it's going to be interesting to see what happens when people actually see a number like 0.04 and they go, gee, you know, I didn't destroy the material when I drew it to 0.04. It actually made good parts. It actually made better parts at 0.04 than it did at 0.08 or 0.09. And we're going to have to go through this whole re-education process. It's going to be very interesting to see what happens.